thanks everybody for coming today. Um, I'm actually from Dublin, so I'm really delighted that the OS Summit is hosted here. So today I'm going to talk about the EU efforts to secure the open, sor open source software. So I'm Kira Carey. I work in developer relations in CloudSmith. And before that, I was a software engineer for over 10 years. So I kind of got into the software supply chain starting in CloudSmith. It's an artifact repository. So it deals a lot with, um, it has a lot of information about how your artifacts are built and signatures and metadata and all that kind of stuff. And working in developer relations, I had to research and write about the software supply chain a lot. And this brought me onto the topic of supply chain, um, software supply chain and software supply chain security. Um, when researching it, I keep on hearing about what the US is doing, their executive order, their work on S-bombs, stuff like that. And as an EU citizen, I want to know what the EU is doing to secure open source software. So that's where I came from. I want to know um, yeah, what the EU is doing for open source security, where the gaps are, and what can be done to drive the EU to action. So our agenda today, I'm going to start with open source software supply chain, a definition on that. I hope you haven't had too many definitions. <laughs> I'm probably going to show that same image. Um, so then I'm going to go on to why should the EU care about open source security? the US's response and the EU's response. And then I'm going to talk about my hopes for the future on EU's policies on open source software. I'm going to finish with what we can do to influence the EU to take, a, to take greater action on open source security. So the only um, direct funding of security for open source was initiated by these two MEPs Anderson and Rita, and in 2014, after the Heartbleed um, critical vulnerability in OpenSSL. So that's the only funding that has gone towards securing open source software, and that was started from a like political, from a political point of view, from these MEPs. And so I think, although the EU should care about open source software, um, we should try to influence it to care about open source software with them um, and by contact, I mean, get political, basically. <laughs> so this is the image, it's like, probably seen it 10 times on the stock. <laughs> so open source is really positive without projects like Kubernetes, Debian, Nginx. Innovation will be painfully slow. Between 70 and 80% of code contains open source software in their dependencies. And a massive part of securing your software supply chain requires securing open source software. And a lot of like critical infrastructure in the EU contains open source, obviously, because wherever there's software, there's open source. So uh, your software supply chain contains all the, um, the steps involved in creating your software. And a big part of that is your third party dependencies, which are likely to be open source. The types of attacks you see on open source tend to um, attack vulnerabilities existing in your open source dependencies like uh, Heartbleed or um, the, the one in December, log for shell And another way is by attacking, a, attacking the mechanism for uh, how you consume that open source. So by attacking, like we usually consume it from a public repository like IPI, NPM, that kind of thing, by attacking that mechanism using type of squatting or dependency confusion, you can um, attack the supply chain. And the end result is similar to all cyber attacks. You get access to customers' data or your own data or information that you don't want to let out. So last year, during the height of the pandemic, there was a cyber attack on the Irish healthcare system. Like doctors and nurses walked into hospitals and they were presented with like a blank screen and they had to go back to pen and paper. Cancer patients had to stop treatment. 
it like it was over a hundred million in damage, even though they they didn't pay the ransomware, and they got the decryption keys back. I don't know what exactly what happened there, but um, the damage was done. So why should the EU care about cyber attacks? This attack on the Irish healthcare system, it's not like an incident, it's a trend. There was an attack last month on a French hospital and patients had to go elsewhere. And other critical systems are being attacked by cyber criminals or state actors. Pipelines, governments, water have all been attacked. And this has stepped up since the war in Ukraine. So Russia has turned off EU's main source of gas. If they also launched a cyber attack on other sources of energy, it'd be an absolute disaster. So European citizens should be protected from attacks on systems th that they rely on. And although the EU member states themselves bear the prime responsibility for countering attacks, these threats can be better addressed at coordinated response at an EU level. Also, the EU is striving to be a leader in cybersecurity. It has um, moved to um, it has moved to improve the cybersecurity in member states, and it recently passed another directive in Parliament to improve the overall security of member states. NIS two replaced NIS one, or NIS. And Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, during her State of the Union address last year, said the EU should strive to become a leader in cybersecurity. So she had her, um, her 2022 State of the Union address this year. So she did mention digitalization, but there was a bit less about cybersecurity because they were pretty busy about Ukraine. So <laughs> but still up there. <laughs> still relevant, guys. So why should the EU care about open source security in particular? They care about cybersecurity, but what about open source security? So open source software supply chain attacks are one of the avenues of attack for a cyber, cyber attack. And they're on the rise. Aqua's security Argonne experts found that software supply chain attacks grew by more than 300% in 2021 compared to 2020. I saw another report by um, Sunnytype Nexus, which said 600%. But I was scared because that was, seemed a lot. <laughs> so I went, I wrote, this 300% is scary anyway, so but 600, it's too much for me. So there was also um, an instant response report by Palo Alto Instant Responders. Those are the guys you send in after you've had a, a cyber attack and you're like, ah, how do I get out of this? And they um, figure out where, you're, where you were, where was the um, access point of attack and clean everything up. And their 2022 report, they analyzed over 600 incidents and um, over the last year, and they found that vulnerabilities in software were the suspected initial access vector in 31% of cases, second only to phishing. So not all of those 31% were open source vulnerabilities, but um, the second most common vulnerability as a point of attack was log for shell so this was released in July and like um, log for shell was only in December so that seems like a lot so we can all agree it's, it's a problem so again why should the EU care about open source software the EU is actually aware of threats from supply chain supply chain attacks the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity and ESA their 2021 threat landscape report included cyber, chain, cyber supply chain attacks. And they also conducted an in-depth study in 2021, analyzing 24 software supply chain attacks from around the world, including SolarWinds and all those ones. So the EU wants to be a leader in cybersecurity. Supply chain attacks are increasing. So the EU need to address open source security as one of the main avenues into a supply chain attack. So I'm going to be sort of been comparing, like I'm only going to go over the US response lightly, but is it even fair to compare the US and the EU and how they respond to um, open source security? Well, there's huge big differences, you know, political structures. We have, we don't really have that executive branch that can just do things like the US can. Um, member states are their own country, 
There's loads of different languages. And the US federal government has control over more areas of, of, um, than the E does, like the military and health. But I think it's kind of fair. I think it's fair. <laughs> they have similar sizes, values, and cyber threats to your critical infrastructure. And they have similar threats to their critical infrastructure and their citizens. And also the EU and the US, they have similar sticks and carrots. They have like, you know, a big bag of money for refunding, and they also have fines available. So um, their responses can be quite similar. Yeah, so um, let's compare them on their SBOMs, vulnerabilities, training and awareness. So we'll start with the US. So after the solar winds attack, um, the um, US the, the published this executive order to improve cybersecurity of software supply chain attacks in May of last year. And it really signaled the importance of SBOMs. That executive order was, uh, for me, I thought it was quite, um, it, the team that wrote that really understood how software was built and how important open source was to software. They, and they didn't, do what maybe other organizations would do and say, oh, we have to take open source out of all our software systems and only use proprietary um, and commercial software. They understood that open source, by being more transparent, has the potential to be more secure than commercial software. But there needs to be steps to make it more um, um, transparent and secure to use. So on SBOMs, they came up with the standardization, the minimum elements of an SBOM. And there is a proposal which will, uh, for, for the, any software sold to the US government to um, contain an SBOM. There's also been a lot of work on promoting the idea of SBOMs. Oh, and <laughs> did I explain SBOMs? Because there's software bill of materials, so it's like an ingredient list for your product. And a lot of that ingredient list will be open source software. So it's about telling, he's been holding this, this um, Alan Friedman from CISA. He's been um, writing about SBOMs, talking to people about SBOMs, and being a real evangelist for the use of them. On vulnerabilities, um, the US has like existing infrastructure on dealing with vulnerabilities that is like more like more advanced, more mature than the EU's. So they have the National Vulnerability Database that's actually hosted by a US institution, and they have like a, a vulnerability disclosure policy as well. But last year they set up a new bug bounty program um, for the Department of Homeland and as, as well as expecting an SBOM with any software sold to the US. They also expect the software to not have any vulnerabilities unless there's mitigating circumstances or um, reasons why you're not vulnerable. On the training front, there, um, this year there was a bill to train federal employees on software supply chain security, especially people purchasing software. Because that's when you're buying software, you have so much power in bringing new open source into your system. So um, that's really important. And last week, the National Security Agency partnered with other agencies to release a, port, a report entitled Securing Software Supply Chain for Developers. And I had some practical ways for developers to um, write secure code, including when um, uh, how to bring dependencies into your code. But the place where the US was really impressive was their awareness. People at the highest levels were talking about open source and open source security and funding the mundane. They're starting with the executive order I talked about. And like um, then it was also after log for shell they brought in loads of stakeholders into the White House from open source maintainers. They brought in consumers and um, of, of open source big tech companies. And, um, and they brought them all in. And like 
talked about how can we improve the security of open source in particular. Then they held a hearing in the Senate where like really impressive people came, <laughs> more impressive than me, <laughs> came to talk about um, log for shell and how to prevent another open source vulnerability in the future. Generously, the, the head of CISA talked about log for shell being the most serious vulnerability she's ever seen. So they've really brought the awareness to the highest levels of, um, and this, uh, this is not nothing, it's sort of like the US's soft power to influence change. So what has the awareness done? Well, there's been lots of, um, there's been announcements about Alpha Omega this week, I think, at this conference. Um, there's the open source software security mobili mobilization plan. There's real money behind these projects and it's funded by big tech, so it's not actually funded by the US government, but it's, um, they've made huge moves to improve open source security and actionable things that they're actually going to do with money behind it. There's also really um, invigorated work in the area. Open SSF has like super active working groups talking about open source security. And the amount of contributions from Sigstore, a project on open SSF to um, make signing software simpler. So it's really activated individuals and organizations to solve this huge problem. So before I talk about the EU's response, we'll just um, give you some background. So the EU in the last few years has like had this big push for digitalization and um, interoperability. And they've talked about it in the State of the Union addresses the last few years. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the big legislations around cybersecurity has been NIS, the network, network um, information security, something like that. <laughs> And um, that came in, that was the first bit of legislation on cybersecurity. It came in 2016, so it's quite recent. And NIS2 has just gone through Parliament, it's likely to be um, published next year. It's a directive. And the aim of it is to increase the minimal level of cybersecurity in member states. So part of that is they've um, listed out, they've, the member states have to list out all the private and public organizations that are um, really important to your, the member states' critical systems. And they've put obligations on those um, organizations or companies. So there has been um, a, a some criticism on this, saying that there's, there's too much of a differentiation between member states. Some member states have taken it really seriously and they've like listed out all of their hospitals and all this kind of thing, but um, others have barely listed any organization. So there is a huge difference in um, how member states have reacted to this, and that's because it's a directive. You know, you have to still transpose that into um, the member states' law. But NIS2 kind of tightened that a bit uh, more than the original NIS, so we should uh, see more alignment over the next few years as it's going to roll out. There's been a lot of other legislation, like we've all heard of GDPR, and um, that's implemented. DORA, banking, it's just been published. Um, there's something on AI that's been published, and soon to be published, maybe next week, is the Cyber Re Resilience Act, um, which is, should be for IOTs. And that should be uh, that should have something on supply chain security, but we'll wait wait for it to be seen. Another thing is that the EU has updated its open source strategy in 2020, and as part of that, it opened up an OSPO office in the, um, the EU's basically their IT department. So the OSPO office for the Commission. And they're a real gem. Their whole um, point is to. Im um, their, oh, there, I have it there. <laughs> their ultimate goal is to change the mentality of the EU Commission, to change culture and embrace open source in terms of practices and tools. Because people are sometimes afraid to use open source, they don't know if they're allowed, they're, they write software that would be um, 
that would be other people could use, but they don't really know the mechanisms for publishing it and thing. So they've really um, promoted the open source culture within the EU Commission. And this is headed up by Miguel Diaz Blanco. So now let's talk about the EU's response to securing open source software. So with respect to cyber um, SBOMs, the Cyber Resilience Act that I talked about, which should be published soon, will probably mention SBOMs. The Cyber Resilience Act is going to be about IOTs and like sort of uh, hardware that's hard to update the software, embedded systems, that kind of thing. And um, if you look at the feedback, I don't know what's actually going to be in it, but they, I've seen some content around it is about the software supply chain and that kind of thing. And there's, you can see um, feedback from the public, and that talks about uh, SBOMs, it talks about Salsa, which is a framework for securely building software. So it'll be interesting to see what's in that. On vulnerabilities, the OSPO office that I talked about, they've created an inventory of all the open source used within the commission. And they've also developed a methodology for, um, for, for prioritizing your inventory, which can be replicated. They've surveyed maintainers of open source um, software critical to the EU commission, like Apache, um, LibXML, Curl, and asked them what they needed to secure their software. And it's kind of what we've all heard. It's um, we need more funding, we need more contributions. And they specifically asked for help with regard to security. And they wanted help from um, the cybersecurity um, agencies and member states' cybersecurity agencies. On vulnerabilities again, the, um, the directives, NIS and NIS2, that's recently gone through Parliament. They have created a list of critical sectors in the EU, both public and private, and there will be requirements. Um, the NIS2 will require these organizations to report security incidents to member states, and now there's a coordinated vulnerability disclosure process across the EU. And as part of that, they'll have a new European vulnerability database. So NIS2 should be rolled like next year. I think they think it'll be um, gone through plenary, and then it'll take another 20 months before it's in um, member states' rule books. Another thing that they've done on vulnerabilities is um, the Bug Bounty Program. This started in 2014 by two MEPs, Rita and Anderson, after the Heartbleed vulnerability. So initially it started out as like, um, these two MEPs came to the commission and they said, um, I'm not going to pass the budget unless you give money towards open source security. And they came up with like giving one million to um, within the EU Commission itself, but that that would go through, go through um, open source security. And it started off as an inventory, and it eventually became um, a bug bounty program and a hackathons. And now the OSPO office actually runs both of them. So I, I think this really illustrates how politics can really move open source security funding and uh, like knowledge within the EU. On training, the European Cybersecurity Agency, ENISA, is um, dedicated to achieving a high level of cybersecurity across Europe and helps Europe prepare for cybersecurity challenges of tomorrow. They hold training days and workshops but there's nothing specific to supply chain security. Uh, NISA had a 2021 report on supply chain attacks, but they only really touched on how to prevent them, and they barely mentioned open source as um, a conduit of the attacks. On awareness, after log for shell the US had all these stakeholder meetings, held hearings in the Senate. They have an SBOM evangelist. Um, I don't see that kind of awareness within the EU. 
uh, bringing in stakeholders on open source security. I couldn't find a hearing in the European Parliament Committee on, on log for shell or open source security. And maybe that's because the two MEPs I talked about, they, haven't, they didn't get elected again in 2019. So maybe if they were here for log for shell we'd be seeing more awareness within the EU. So some of the good stuff in the EU on open source security, um, their bug bounty program has like found hundreds of bugs and fix them, <laughs> I hope. Um, the, the EU Commission's OSPO office is a real shining light for um, not just open source security, but open source culture in general. And I think the NIS and NIS2 uh, vulnerability disclosure infrastructure will uh, shine a light on vulnerabilities that weren't even disclosed. So I think a lot of, um, uh, we don't even know where we are because people just pay the ransomware and then um, they move on. They don't disclose it to their member state. They don't disclose it to the government. So nobody has like an accurate picture on um, cyber attacks. The bad, um, so open source maintainers of critical systems are not funded directly to improve security. It would be great to see some funding maybe on, um, I know public repositories now like PyPI and RubyGems, they're uh, forcing some of their top contributors to have um, uh, 2FA, which is great for security, but actually um, supporting that takes a lot of people power and money. Like if you're resetting 2FA, you need people to actually look into that and reset it for people. It'd be great if we could, like, if the EU would fund security directly that way or even um, fund them by, if, if a maintainer does, an open, uh, does a security course, that they would get money and training behind that. There's lots of different ways to fund them directly, but it is difficult to kind of get money from the EU. Another issue is that bug bounty program that I talked about that's really successful, it's been running since 2014. It's not a permanent program, so it could be dropped any minute. The initial sponsors of the program, the two MEPs, they, um, they're not elected again, so they're now they're looking for new sponsors. They're, looking, they're always looking for funding. You know, it would be great if they could just concentrate on the good work that they're doing instead of having to look for funding every, every year sometimes. Sometimes they're on a three-year... Um, they have a three-year fund, but uh, so permanency would be great. So the OSPO office is only over the EU Commission. So when they're doing an inventory of all the open source, it's only used in the Commission. It's nothing to do with critical infrastructure in member states. It would be great to um, uh, fund OSPO offices within member states or to um, have... ENISA, the cybersecurity agency, have some control over that and an inventory of all the open source would be um, excellent. You know where to start, you know what you're using, you can make decisions, strategic decisions on that. So another thing is SBOMs weren't mentioned by NIS and NIS2 directives and they haven't really been mentioned much in ENISA's content. It'd be great to see more training on SBOMs and maybe NIS3 will, will mention it and maybe ask for critical systems to provide SBOMs when they're something like that. Or maybe they'll, when you're purchasing software, you'll require an SBOM like the US government is looking to do. But at the same time, I suppose the tools around generating and analyzing SBOMs is quite young. So, um, I can understand why they didn't want to put that in legislation yet. There's also a lack of training materials and workshops from Anisha. It would um, be great if they could train maintainers, if they can train um, software developers working in critical systems, if they could train procurement officers. Um, so all those things would be great. And um, so open source security needs to be talked more about ENISA and on committees and MEPs. That awareness that the US is bringing, I'd love to see that in the EU as well. So what's next for the EU and open source security? Well, um, uh, for ENISA, actually they have um, advertisements for their security advisory board. They're looking for people to 
beyond our board and that's ending like the end of this month September the end of 30th of September so if anybody here is like an uh, open source security expert it'd be great to have that that knowledge on, on the cybersecurity agency in Europe and like really help them understand the problem and invest in it um, I'd love for there to be funding available I know the EU is talking about how it wants digitalization and interoperability, but that all has to be based on a secure system. And a lot of software is based on open source. And for, and for, um, <laughs> oh sugar, oh sugar, sorry. Yeah. It's okay, this happens. Yes, I think I've talked about <laughs> So what can I do next? I've actually preferred this because I didn't realize I couldn't have my speaker notes. <laughs> so that was just a fake, fake out. I did that on purpose. So uh, what can I do next in, um, in the EU to invest in open source security? So what I was talking about there, I need, I need people to apply, apply to the board for ANISA. And also I want um, people to ask their MEPs, what are they doing to secure open source software in critical systems? Like I was saying, the only direct funding towards security of open source software has been this bug bounty program. Those two MEPs is go are gone. There hasn't been um, any MEPs asking for funding in the same way since they left. So we need politicians to understand that problem. Like during this talk, I, I contacted MEPs. They got back to me. I, they don't. I'm not like an important person. MEPs do do want to do the right thing, and if we're not talking to them as an individual or as a community, well, then they're probably going to fill that knowledge either with no knowledge or with like consultants' idea of what they should do. So um, I'd love for the open source community to work to it together to lobby the EU to invest in open source in order to protect critical infrastructure. Like other special interest groups petition their MEPs for attention and funding. And the open source community should do the same. So um, there's actually, I found out today, there's this program called Digital Compass. And the EU is defining and asking for feedback for its digital ambitions for, for 2030. Um, let's make sure that our thoughts are heard too. So Ursula van der Leyen talked about how the EU should strive to become a leader in cybersecurity. Policies and funding and open source in general and our critical systems specifically are important to the growth, success and security of the EU. So that's me all done. Any questions? Boom. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah? Um, is this only for um, the EU and the US to do stuff together? Like, uh, what could be done in the other level that is not the EU or the US? Like, yeah, so I've seen a lot of like interaction between the US and the EU recently on digital matters. They have like, the EU has opened an office in San Francisco, and I think it's mostly to deal with regulation. But, you know, if they're not busy, Maybe they could <laughs> they could talk about um, the open source could be part of that because there are a lot of um, like open SSF. It be has been working with the U.S. government. It'd be great if the EU also works with them on that mobilization plan because all the work that they're going to be doing to improve security for open source in the U.S. will benefit the EU. But there's been other um, talks of communication with um, the U.S. and the EU are working on improving. Um, digital infrastructure in Africa or something like that. I heard that recently. So there seems to be a few things happening, lining up. Um, so I, I'd love to see them working together. It would be an absolute, it would be so terrible if they came up with their own standard for SBOMs. So it's stuff like that would be, would be amazing. Any other questions? Hey. <laughs> 
A 12 month. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. Um, so I think over oh, software supply chain security in general. Um, I think it's how we just don't know what software we're using. And like, if you don't know what you're using, you're really, you know, setting yourself up for failure. So I, that's why I think S bombs are so important. Because if you know where you are, you can make a strategy to incrementally improve. But if you don't know where you are, then you're just like a sitting duck. Hey. Yeah, there's there's some member states that are like more advanced than others. Like um, Germany has an OSPO. Some cities have OSPOs. Uh, so it's mostly in departments they'll have an OSPO. So um, there there is OSPOs in and in uh, member states, but they don't seem to be like at the high. You know, like they're not like like the Irish government doesn't have an OSPO at that high level. It seems to be like in, stuck in departments or maybe they're not even, um, they don't even call themselves an OSPO. That's what there is a, there is a talk today about OSPOs <laughs> in Europe. I was like, oh, I wish I didn't have to know any more information. I've already written my talk. But um, yeah, <laughs> they were saying, <laughs> that's where I heard that a lot of uh, cities have OSPOs. I think the city of Amsterdam has one. And, um, open source is uh, quite good and in, in quite mature in, in some countries like France, Finland, Estonia. Um, and it'd be great to bring that up too. And I know um, that digital compass, there will be funding going directly to member states if once it passes. And it'd be great if part of that could be f used to fund, train, and like for travel, for events to do with OSPOs. I'd love that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you.